Hello and welcome everyone to another alternate media special. I've got something very special for everyone tonight. Uh, this is an interview that I've been looking forward to doing very much uh, with uh, a good friend of mine. I, I think I can say we've we've become friends and uh, someone I, I certainly look up to a whole lot. So if I seem like I'm a little starstruck, just, uh, you know, let that be what it is. But let me bring up my guest for tonight, uh, Dr. John Roseman. Mr. Roseman, how are you doing today? I'm doing very well, Brad. Thank you. <laughs> I... I I definitely appreciate you uh, giving us the time today to to do this interview. Um, I, I just thank you for being here. <laughs> well, I thank you for inviting me to be here, Bradley. Thanks. Absolutely. So your field of work is, or, or the your field of expertise is in the child rearing area. And uh, I think a lot of our, our, our viewers and followers are uh, probably going to find this a, a very fascinating discussion uh, because I know many of them are parents. Uh, how, how did you come into that field initially? Uh, completely serendipitously. I was in the right place at the right time. And uh, uh, it was 1976 and I was working as a staff psychologist at a community mental health center in North Carolina. And a person that I happened to be meeting with in terms of a staff meeting, um, she said, uh, you seem to be a good writer and a good communicator. Have you ever thought about writing a newspaper column? And it, just, it turned out that she was the wife of the editor in chief of the local newspaper. So the next thing I knew, I was a newspaper columnist. And then the Charlotte Observer picked me up and um, they put me into syndication in 1978. And uh, at, at its peak, my column was syndicated in about 750 newspapers. And um, um, I just retired the newspaper column even after 47 years. Um, but I have no intention of retiring. I enjoy what I do too much. And this is a ministry to me, a ministry to families. And, um, by way of, uh, credentials, I'm a child and family psychologist and, uh, writer, public speaker. I've written about, I don't know, 20 books on raising children, various aspects of it. And, um, so uh my my primary credentials are that i've been married to the same woman one has to be very clear about that these days for <laughs> for 55 years and we have two adult children and we have uh seven grandchildren ranging from 15 to 29. Wonderful. And yeah, no, 55 years. That's uh, that's quite a testament there. <laughs> well, especially since we were married when we were 20 and 19 and were parents nine months later when my wife was still 19 years old. So Absolutely. Yeah, we, we, we've set some sort of record. I don't know what it is. <laughs> but... <laughs> so you mentioned having written, you know, 20, 20 or so books. Um, out of those books, if you had to pick one as your absolute favorite, what, 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 what would that be? What would be the, the one book that you would most highly recommend to new parents? It would be my latest, um, which hands down is my best. The title is the Bible parenting code, which is sort of uh, tongue in cheek, um, but uh, what I'm doing is pointing out to people that uh, even in scripture that ostensibly has nothing to do with children or families, there is relevance to the process of raising a child. So I talk about, for example, the relevance of uh, the second great commandment, love your neighbor as yourself to the raising of a child pointing out in that case that it, in fact, the proper raising of a child 
is an act of love for your neighbor. That Amen. you raise a child for the purpose of raising a citizen who will be a blessing to the community and the culture. And so in a very, very literal sense, proper child rearing is an act of love for your neighbor. And the, um, I've selected 40 scripture, which is a good biblical number. And uh, I explicate those 40 scripture at about 200 pages. Spectacular. So that's one, that's one for all our viewers. That's one that you certainly need to look for, uh, for, for those parents and, and people who may become parents. Um, so in your professional experience, uh, especially having done this as long as you've done it, have you noticed a discernible difference in the parenting styles and outcomes uh, between religious and non-religious households? Not really, to tell you the truth. The, the expected answer would probably be, oh yeah, I've noticed a great difference. But uh, the fact of the matter is that most uh, religious parents, in my experience, are parenting according to the world. They are not parenting according to the word. And they're having, as a consequence, the same problems that uh, are being had by parents in general in the culture. And we're having very definitely, I mean, a person my age can very quickly see this, very, very readily see it, that we in America, parents in America, are having more problems with the raising of children today than parents uh, in my parents' day. I was raised in the 1950s. Uh, parents in my parents' day would have even thought possible um, we're having not only a quantity of problems in the raising of children that would be shocking to parents in the 1950s, but we're having uh, problems that are of a nature that would be shocking to parents in the 1950s. I mean, for example, Bradley, uh, it was unheard of in the 1950s for a child above the age of two. I mean, uh, really and truly a toddler uh, for a child to be hitting a parent. And today we've got children hitting parents ubiquitously all over America and uh, telling parents in no uncertain terms, uh, I'm not going to do what you've just told me to do, uh, not paying attention to their parents, um, disrespecting their parents, Children as young as five years old calling their parents vile names. Um, and I regard all of this as a consequence of the fact that in the late 60s and early 1970s, we as a culture tacitly agreed to begin taking our child rearing advice, our marching orders as parents from people like myself, psychologists and other mental health professionals. And um, it's time to tell our audience that I don't believe psychology qualifies as a science. Uh, I don't believe that psychology is a force for good in culture. I think psychology has been a wrecking ball in American culture and especially where the American family is concerned. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. You, so you mentioned children hitting their kids and that's, or, or children hitting their parents. Uh, and, and yeah, that, that seems like something that would have been absolutely unthinkable in an older time, even for myself, you know, at something that was absolutely off the table, not even considerable. But so, of course, and here, here's a little secret for everyone watching. You mentioned writing newspaper columns. And as it turns out, my parents read those newspaper columns when I was very young. So uh, I was in, 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 a, in a good part raised uh, very much according to your advice. <laughs> to what degree would you place the importance of scripture in family life and parenting? 
Well, uh, God created us. God uh, designed us. He uh, has, he designed us. He created us with not only a design for our physical bodies, but our, our lives. And uh, we have uh, significantly departed from that. Of course, the departure began in the Garden of Eden. And uh, it's my contention that uh, when all is said and done, the only parenting manual that American parents need in order to raise children properly, according to God's design, is God's word. And there can be no better manual for the raising of a child than the manual written by our creator. Amen. So in your lifetime, have you noticed a generational shift in family structure and parenting styles? Well, the, the shift began to occur, as I said a little earlier, in the late 60s and early 1970s. And I was there in graduate school when it was happening. And I did not know what was happening. Uh, I didn't have a clear understanding of what was going on. But what was occurring was a paradigm shift in the way that we raise kids. And one aspect of that paradigm shift placed great emphasis on the need for parents to properly understand and properly respond to their children's feelings. And this was an, an entirely new understanding. People uh, your age, uh, generally speaking, um, don't understand that prior to this paradigm shift, parents weren't really that concerned with their children's emotional states. And that may sound bad, but before I go on, let me say that the mental health of children statistically verifiable, the verifiable mental health of children in the 1950s was a whopping 10 times better than the mental health of children today. And the decline in child mental health can be traced back chronologically to this paradigm shift that I'm referring to in the late 60s, early 1970s. Prior to this time, the mental health of children was improving in America. And then we began listening to psychologists tell us that it was time for us as a country to let children express their feelings freely, which I had not been allowed to express my feelings freely. And I tell people all the time, have you known someone who believes that they are entitled to express their feelings freely? The person in question is a sociopath. The person in question is an antisocial, possibly dangerous individual. You do not want to be in relationship with that person. And so, yes, we were not allowed to express our feelings freely. And I ask people my age, you know, I know what the answer is going to be, but I ask them anyway, uh, were your parents concerned about your feelings? Did they talk to you a lot about your feelings? And did they talk about how do you how you should express your feelings and so on? And when I ask that question, Bradley, people my age, the typical initial knee-jerk level response is laughter at the absurdity of the proposition. And then it's usually, no, John, my parents were not that concerned about how I felt about much of anything. <laughs> now let, let me let me clarify this. You know, if if a child had a legitimate feeling, and before I go on, why legitimate? Aren't all feelings legitimate? No, children are soap opera factories. <laughs> so all of their feelings are not legitimate. You know, they're narcissistic, they're self-centered, and destructive. And so if we had one of us 1950s boomers, we had a legitimate feeling. I mean, 
you know, uh, our dog was killed by a car. Our parents would have been very comforting and very understanding. But outside of the realm of legitimacy, no, we were told pretty much get it under control, get over it. Life is full of problems. And if what you learn to do in response to problems is throw tantrums, you're not going to be a very happy human being. And uh, so the, the focus was not on our feelings. The focus was on us learning how to deal with the struggles of life. And uh, suddenly parents began hearing late 60s, early 70s. Oh, no. You know, children weren't allowed to express their feelings freely. Their feelings were repressed and uh, gave way to all sorts of neurotic behavior. And uh, if you uh, pay attention to your children's feelings and talk to them about their feelings and so on, uh, we can create a child rearing utopia here in America. Well, we've created a train wreck. That's why I have a job. <laughs> I mean, I have a job because of this train wreck that we oh, call goodness. parenting. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's been nothing but bad. Somebody asked me the other day, John, is there any redeeming value in anything psychologists have been saying about children and child rearing over the last 50 odd years? I said, no, there's been nothing of redeeming value. <laughs> My profession doesn't know what it's talking about when it comes to children and raising them properly. <laughs> so, how crucial to a child's development and future would you say a two-parent household is? Well, I, I was raised in a one-parent household for seven years. My father was in the military uh, in my early years, and he was stationed overseas in Japan. He was part of the occupying force. And um, uh, then the Korean War started up, and he re-enlisted. And then my mother divorced him because she was tired of not having her husband around anyway. And so for uh, the overwhelming majority of the first seven years of my life, I was raised by a single mother. And um, I can testify to the fact that while I have no point of comparison, you know, there isn't another John Roseman, a doppelganger that I, who was raised in a two-parent family that I can compare myself to. But, you know, everything was fine for me. I was okay. And I, I didn't mourn my father's absence. Uh, I didn't lose sleep over where he was and was he coming home and where's my daddy. Um, my life was fine. And it was fine in part, Bradley, I will tell you, because nobody talked about it. Nobody made his absence into a soap opera. Now, the statistics are very, very clear. The children who are raised in single parent households are considerably more at risk of um, mental health, academic, social, emotional problems. Uh, far more so than children who are raised in intact two-parent families. But what statistics report is an average. So right. what that means is that there are kids in two-parent families who are doing much worse than some kids in single-parent families. So I think it's very simplistic to, to be arguing that Children in two-parent families are better off. The fact of the matter is, on average, they are better off. But there is no guarantee on the basis of a two-parent family. There would are say, no outcome guarantees. Would you say it, it that uh, that in and of itself may part and parcel have have to do with how stable and uh, and uh, well? I guess stable is really the best word for it. The The marriage itself is of the two parents, uh, whether or not they're getting along as parents should. Well, you really raised, uh, you've opened up a can of worms there, Bradley, because it's my contention and people who 
uh, have followed my newspaper column, read my books, uh, and are now following me uh, on the internet, um, know that one of my primary contentions is that in today's American family, when the first child is born, the husband and wife stop being a husband and a wife and they start being mom and dad. And the marriage, the relationship between the two of them slips to the back burner, so to speak. And these two people become more interested in establishing a wonderful relationship with the child than they seem to be interested in having with one another. So the way that I put it is that two people who are married begin to have children and they begin to act like they took a vow on their wedding day that said, I take you to be my husband, I take you to be my wife until children do us part. Mm. And this is a huge difference between the family of the 1950s and the family of today. I was raised when my mother remarried, it was very, very clear to me even though it had been pretty much only my mother and myself for seven years, it became very, very clear to me that her relationship with my stepfather trumped her relationship with me. That her primary obligation at this point was to the marriage. It was not to me. And one would think, well, that's rather shocking, traumatic, uh, disruptive, etc. No, it really wasn't. I was glad to see my mother was in a in a, a relationship that seemed to be sustaining and bringing her joy. So, you know, what what has happened over the last fifty years, Bradley, is that uh, one of the statistics—it's a canary in the coal mine statistic is that one of the most at-risk times for divorce in the life of a married couple is immediately after the last child has been emancipated. And I've seen this up close and personal. Uh, I've seen people emancipate the last of five children and then within a year get a divorce. And uh, again, it's a canary in the coal mine statistic. You can't, you can't put your marriage on the back burner for, you know, what, 30 years as you raise three to five kids and expect that the marriage is going to be recoverable uh, after 30 years of having been collecting dust and spider webs. And, uh, so, you know, one of my one of my primary pieces of advice to people is, you know, be married first and be mom and dad part time. Don't be lured into the cultural ideal of, you know, I, you know, I heard a guy say the other day, he's a young person. He's uh, in his late 20s. He said he said, I want to be a great dad. And I took him aside a little bit later, and he, he's one of my grandchildren, in fact. And I said, listen, man, you, you are marrying so-and-so not because she wants a great dad. She wants a great husband. And that's your primary obligation. And I talked to him for, you know, like about five or ten minutes. And he was extremely grateful at the end of the conversation that I had corrected what could have been a disastrous course for him, you know, but it, it's this, I want to be a great dad, you know? Um, and in the course of being the cultural ideal of the great dad, you forget how to be a husband and you forget that that's your primary role in your family. That's, that's fascinating. And, and certainly, you know, from my own experience, I can definitely say um, that my parents certainly took that advice to heart uh, because, you know, if and I remember instances because I was a little hellion as a child, 
um, where <laughs> perhaps I, uh, perhaps I, you know, I mouthed off to my mother and, uh, when addressing that, uh, in, in a disciplinary way later, my father would, would tell me, you're not going to speak to my wife that way. He didn't tell me you're not going to speak to your mother that way. There was a, there was a clearly defined boundary where in this capacity, he was speaking as her husband, uh, as, as you know, as well as my father, but it was it, it was to establish the dynamic that they were a married couple before they were my parents, you know. Yeah, he uh, was and, speaking. He was speaking to you as as his wife's God assigned protector. Absolutely, absolutely. And these are very the the problem with all of this. I'm sure you understand is that all of these concepts have been demonized over the last 50 years by the cultural left. That. And, yeah. And uh, so, you know, we sit here and we talk about these things, but, you know, the, the male being the, the, the wife's uh, uh, God-designated protector, and these are concepts that for a young audience, Bradley, are, they're, they're, they're even bizarre. You know, that, that someone would actually be talking about this stuff, you know, come on, man, that, that, you know, that's like 70 years ago. That's right. It was 70 years ago. <laughs> and, you know, the, uh, the culture has been brainwashed into believing that by the progressives that anything, you know, more than 20 years ago is, 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 uh, irrelevant. Yep. Uh, we shouldn't be using it as a model. Uh, we shouldn't try to go back to that. But the fact of the matter is that child rearing was not a difficult thing prior to this paradigm shift that I talked about earlier. And um, the family of the 50, 50s, during when the last decade or so of when child rearing was easy, children were obedient. And by the way, Let's clarify that demonization. Children who are be obedient are not robots. These are kids who do better in school than kids who are not obedient. And as common sense would affirm, the obedient child is a happier child. And you go back to that time, the 1950s, children were better off. Marriages were more sustainable. Uh, everything was better. And the idea that we have made things better uh, by uh, uh, updating parenting and uh, revising parenting standards and, you know, supposedly equalizing the role of mom and dad, it's absurd. There's no statistics that would back this up at all. It's a fantasy. It, it's fascinating that you that you brought that up independently because that directly pertains to my, the next question that I've got here, which is, you know, so the, the topic of masculinity and whether or not it's toxic and uh, whether or not it's under attack has been, you know, highly discussed and disputed in recent days. Uh, some would even say that the controversy is an intentional attack on fathers specifically. What would your thoughts be on that and the importance of fathers in the home? Well, the culture, and, and again, I was there when all of this was uh, gathering momentum. Um, the, uh, the culture began demonizing masculinity in the late 60s and early 70s. And it's my belief that men did what is called identifying with the aggressor. In this case, men were being aggressed against by... Uh, women and the culture in general demonized as sexual aggressors and uh, people uh, who weren't really contributing very much at a spiritual level to the culture that women could get along without men just fine. And I believe that men began to buy into this. It was one of their reactions. They bought into it. And so what we find today is that the typical dad 
is not a paragon of masculinity. He is as a very, very, uh, he's now deceased, but a very, very intelligent uh, cultural sociologist said, he's a second mommy. He's trying to connect with his child emotionally. He's trying to be a nurturer. He's trying to be the understanding, soft, affectionate, cuddly dad. And um, my belief is that God created us male and female, and he created us very different. Uh, and he meant for those differences to be carried into the process of raising children. So children don't need two moms any more than children need two dads. If we're going to argue for the two parent family, then the two parent family, you know, politically incorrect alert coming up. Uh, the two parent family needs to be a male and a female, biological male, biological female. You know, all these things have to be clarified these days absurdly. But uh, yeah, the two parent family needs to be a biological male and a biological female who are acting according to God's design for males and females. <laughs> Politically incorrect trigger warning. I love that. <laughs> so how how important is the word no for parents to use <laughs> well no is what the world says to anyone more often than not now may, maybe the world didn't say no to George, uh, George Soros uh, very much and and maybe <laughs> the world didn't say no to Bill Gates very much uh, but for most of us groveling down here in the trenches the, the word the world says no to you a whole lot more than it says yes. And I, I keep telling parents, look, it's your job at a very practical level to properly represent reality to your child so that your child learns what reality is all about. You know, it's not about his fantasies of what he wants the world to be like. It's the way the world is like. And he's got to learn to deal with that. And um, so, yeah, because reality says no more than it says yes. Uh, and probably 10 times more often than it says yes. Um, I, I mean, Bradley, if I was to go back and count today, what is today? Today is uh, June the 11th, 2023. If I was to go back and count, from this point in time, three o'clock in the afternoon, Eastern time, how many times the world has said no to me already? It would be probably uh, at least a dozen. Okay. <laughs> I mean, little things, you know, right. <laughs> you know, no, you can't do that right now. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And so, no, you can't have that right now. And that's the way. Yes. So it's very important that parents represent to children that reality correctly. You know, children have this fantasy. It's this supreme being fantasy that what they want, they deserve to have. And that's what the terrible twos is all about. It's all about that fantasy. What I want, I deserve to have. That's the way the two-year-old thinks. And that's why you get tantrums and oppositional behavior, you know, uh, all two-year-olds are bipolar. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so it's very important that children learn how to cope with that. I, I, I'm writing a book, and I, I'm telling a, a story in the book about my mother. I was in the fifth grade, and I came home from school one day, and she said, uh, you've been coming home out of breath, and you've been coming home all sweaty. What's going on? And uh, I said, Danny chases me home from school every day, wants to beat me up. And I expected her to say, well, I'll put an end to that. You know, I'll march up the street and talk to Danny's mother and give her a piece of my mind. And then I'll march over to the school and tell the principal that it's his responsibility to put an end to all this. And, you know, the kind of thing, excuse me for saying so, that today's parents would do. And instead, <laughs> my mother looked at me and she said, 
find another way home. <laughs> and that was the end of the discussion. You know, she wasn't going to do anything about daddy. <laughs> you know, just it, it was my problem, and I had to solve it. What what a concept! What a lesson! <laughs> what a concept! And, and so uh, I I found another way home because um, I know I must have because Danny never beat me up so. <laughs> so what are your thoughts on, because this is another controversial topic, especially today, uh, what are your thoughts on corporal punishment, as they call it? Uh, <laughs> well, I, I think too much uh, is made of spanking. <laughs> too much of, is made of spanking by both sides of the argument. Um, you know, spanking, it, it, it is not child abuse. Uh, per se, um, a, a child can be struck in an abusive fashion, but then any form of discipline can be used abusively. So we've got to agree on what is the standard of abuse. And I suggest that, it, that the standard of abuse is far higher than what a spanking represents. That's number one. Uh, number two, the Bible does not, and this is the other side of that argument, the Bible does not mandate spankings. Uh, when it says, uh, Proverbs twenty-two fifteen, foolishness is bound in the heart of the child, but the rod of discipline will drive it far from him. That is a metaphor. The rod of discipline is being used as a metaphor for parents properly representing God's authority to their children. I've got a dog who's barking in the background. You can probably hear. That's all um, right. There's He's nothing I can say. do about the dog. The dog believes what I want, I deserve to have. And so, you know. Everything comes full circle. <laughs> a perpetual, perpetual two-year-old. So as far as, yeah, as, as far as that, I, I, I can definitely say, you know, in, in my experience in the online world, the spanking has definitely been, I think, certainly over demonized. And, and then also having been exposed to a more independent fundamental brand of uh, Baptist uh, earlier in life, I can certainly see the other side where there, there, there may almost be an, an, an over-reliance on the concept of spanking. Uh, so I, I, I can say that I would certainly agree. There's, there's, there's probably a happy medium middle ground on that subject. Um, but well, you know, you... Bradley, uh, I don't mean to interrupt, but it's very unfortunate that, um, a, an entire generation or more of Christian influencers, um, basically, uh, sent the message to, their flocks that spanking was what God wanted you to do when your child misbehaves. And, you know, I, I would say to parents all the time, do you really think that God thinks that simplistically? You know, that, that every time your child misbehaves, you're supposed to spank him. Uh, it, it makes no sense uh, from a very you know, rational point of view. And in the second place, there is a distinct difference between, in the Bible, the use of the term a rod and the term the rod. And the rod, if you use the rule of scripture interprets scripture, then you have to arrive at the conclusion that the rod which is the phrase used every single time the word rod is used in the context of the discipline of children, that that is a metaphor for parents. And I'll use a new age term for parents channeling God's authority in the way that they deal with their child, you know, and, and now we're on the issue of discipline. And I've got to say that discipline 
in the modern parent's mind is all about the proper use of consequences. No. Discipline is constituted 99% of a proper attitude. The proper most, attitude. The, Let me say, explain the, that further. Yeah. Well, look around you, people. Uh, parents who are having the fewest discipline problems with their children watch what they're doing and what they're doing is they are acting like superior beings acting like superior beings i i you know what i i know i've i've seen other videos where you've spoken on that where you you've mentioned things uh, about how you don't you know, it, it's it's not necessarily appropriate to get down on a child's level when when you're explaining maybe something that they've done wrong or or uh, an incorrect uh, behavior that they've exhibited. Uh, but that that you stand up as an adult who is literally physically bigger than them and and let that reality uh, be something that uh, that that kind of rests on them as they're listening. But they're not, but you don't stand up in order to present yourself in a threatening way. You stand up, it, it's almost like you become a metaphor. You become a metaphor for the fact that your point of view prevails over their point of view. And you watch parents who are having very few discipline problems with their kids. They're talking to their kids like their kids are intelligent beings. They're they're not getting down to their level, bending over at the waist when they talk to them, putting their hands on their knees. They're not using a sing-song voice. They're not explaining themselves to their children. They act like they, they incorporate uh, universal leadership principles in the way that they deal with their kids. Universal leadership principle. You don't use a whole lot of words when you're talking to a person that you are managing. Today's parents are using, I mean, they're blah, 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 on and on and on, explaining themselves, explaining why that wasn't appropriate, explaining why there were alternatives to hitting Billy. You didn't have to hit Billy. You could have done this instead. You know, and all this is in my stepfather's inimitable words. All of this is going in one ear and coming right out the other. And, uh, you know, uh, universal leadership principle, you don't explain yourself. You know, when a general says to a private, okay, we're now going into battle. Okay. And the private says, oh, why? <laughs> does, does the general turn around and, and bend down and look at the private and say, well, now let me try and help you understand this. Uh, I, I mean, no, <laughs> no, I, I can't even begin to, uh, to fathom the absurdity. And I don't mean to be critical of them, but truly today's parents, the way that they behave toward their children is absurd. And a guy, a guy came up to me, I don't know, a couple of years ago. He said, John, I really have that, have a problem with the, your idea that parents ought to act like superior beings. Uh, I, I feel that uh, I'm my child's equal. And I said, uh, well, you're having a significant number of discipline problems, aren't you? He said, uh, how did you know? <laughs> I was like, how did I know? <laughs> You know, uh, an equal can't discipline an equal. It's just that simple. You know, if you're an equal, then you're not a role model. If you're an equal, then you're incapable of disciplining the individual in question. Absolutely. So you have to act like a superior being. And you are. You know, you've lived 30 years. Your child has lived four. Who? Who's the superior being here? I mean, really and truly, you know, let's get rid of the fantasy that uh, everybody is an equal. 
uh, and confront reality, your job as a parent is to lead and you can't lead if you are an equal. So don't act like one. Absolutely. So to kind of segue into, into something a bit different here, <clears throat> what, what are your thoughts on some of the other, uh, Christian parenting gurus, I guess you can call them, or people like uh, Michael Pearl from the No Greater Joy Ministry, if, if he's one that you're familiar with. Or what, what are your thoughts on, on kind of the others in your field? Um, I think most of the people in the Christian parenting field have been heavily influenced by psychology. And I think that... Um, without naming names um they overemphasize the use of consequences they don't understand that the discipline of a child is 98 percent a matter of how you speak it's a matter of how you present yourself it's your body language your your vocal language it's the expression on your face it's your tone of voice um that's how you discipline a child and uh, then there are those hanging around who still overemphasize the importance of spanking um there are christian parenting influencers out there who are talking about high self-esteem which is the most unbiblical concept ever to infiltrate a culture. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. You know, people, when I'm saying this to an audience, people are looking at me like, what? And I, I will I will look out at the audience and I will say, did Jesus say, blessed are those who think highly of themselves? <laughs> did he say that? Not that um, I ever recall. <laughs> yeah, I must have missed that. You know, did, did he say those who exalt themselves will be even further exalted? I mean, uh, <laughs> the, the idea that Christians, authentic Christians, embrace the idea that we ought to feel wonderful about ourselves is just absurd. It's ridiculous. And, and you know, all of this emphasis on self-esteem in children, which began with the publication of a book called The Psychology of Self-Esteem in 1968, coincides with what? A 50-year ongoing decline in child mental health. How about that? So, what... Because we've, we've touched on, on some scriptural elements here already, uh, especially the use of the rod as, as a metaphor here. So what do you think the, the fullest implications are? Or what, what does scripture mean to tell us when it says to train up a child in the way he should go? Well, you know, it's interesting that there is now some exegetical argument about that, but my own personal belief is that uh, you take that at face value. And it's what I said before. Uh, you, as a parent, you understand that life is struggle. And life is not a bowl of cherries. Life is not a yellow brick road. Life is struggle. And uh, we need to prepare our children for struggle. And the way you do that is you 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 minimize how much you help them solve problems in their lives. You give them guidance, you give them direction, but you don't solve every problem that comes up in their lives, which seems to have become one of the standards of good parenting in America today uh, it is paraphrased, the good parent solves all of his or her child pro child's problems. And like I said, my, my parents, they were not subscribers to that idea. When my mother said, find another way home, she meant, as I said before, 
Danny is your problem. And you have got to learn how to solve things like this. And if there was no solution other than mommy gets involved, she would have gotten involved. But there were solutions other than mommy gets involved. And so you train up a child according to the characteristics of the world that he is going to encounter when he emancipates. Absolutely. And in your professional opinion, <clears throat> what is, what would you say is the most important lesson for new parents to learn and take to heart? Be married first and be mom and dad part time. Mm, that's yep. We talked about that. <laughs> if 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 uh, parenting is done properly, then uh, it is a part time proposition. You know, my wife and I have been married for fifty five years because we took our marriage seriously. We did not marriage part-time and parent full-time, which is what's going on in 99.9% .9 of American households today. We were married full-time and we parented part-time. And we let our children know what we were there for and what we were not there for. We are not here to make you happy. We are not here to solve all your problems. We are here to provide for you adequately. We are here to protect you adequately. We are here to lead you into adulthood competently. Uh, we are not here to guarantee your success in life. And this is, this is what's, uh, you know, it's interesting to me, Bradley. I will, uh, I'll ask a parent in his thirties, her thirties, what are you trying to accomplish? And in the first place, quite often, they can't answer that simple question. Mm. They don't know what they're trying to accomplish because, and, and my explanation for that is that parenting in today's America is let's just take it one step at a time. Let's take a step. And then let's plan the next step and let's take that step. It's a one step at a time process instead of seeing the big picture. If you see the big picture that your purpose in effect is to help your child successfully emancipate, as I sometimes put it tongue in cheek, your purpose is to get your child out of your house. <laughs> You know, out of your house and into a life of his own. And if, if you see it that way, then you see down the road. And if you see down the road, it's going to be very, very difficult to make big mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. It's going to be difficult to make any big ones. <laughs> oh, well, so you said you were working on a new book. Is that something you want to get into at all or no? We don't have to. That's this is we can cut this section here. <laughs> oh, well, I'm writing a book on theology. I'm an amateur theologist and uh, I'm writing a book that challenges the the standard ne theological narrative concerning Genesis chapter three, uh, which I call the shame hypothesis. I, I don't believe that the text supports the idea that Adam and Eve, upon the eating of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, felt shame. The text fails to support that completely. Uh, it, that, that whole idea got its start with Luther, who wrote uh, five essays on, uh, on Genesis 3 and uh, who delivered those essays and was very famous for those essays. And um, the, the hypothesis that he presented has 
lingered on in Christian theology ever since. How about that? And so what I'm, trying, what I'm trying to do with my next book has uh, nothing to do with parenting other than the fact that the main characters are God's first two children. How about that? I was going to say, I, I'm sure you and I could go round and round talking about our problems with Luther in, in, in some capacity or another. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, the uh, I, I refer to Luther as uh, the in the book as uh, the dubious privilege of being Luther. <laughs> <laughs> well... We're, uh, we're here at the end of the interview. Uh, one more time, we'd like to go ahead and, and advertise uh, the book you said was your absolute favorite and, uh, and the one you would most highly recommend. That is by John Roseman, The Bible Parenting Code, Revealing God's Perfect Parenting Plan. Uh, so for all of our parents or soon-to-be parents who are watching, definitely something to add to your bookshelves along with all of the other books he's written also <laughs> uh is there is there uh any anything else you'd like to say to close out let 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 the folks know where to find your website where to where to find out more about you and more of your content uh no not really i mean um i think we've we've done a good job of covering the basics um my website is at uh, parentguru.com and um i've got a Substack Weekly, uh, johnroseman.substack.com. And I'm doing now uh, a weekly podcast following in your footsteps. And, uh, <laughs> um, you know, I've, uh, I'm 75 years old. I'm still of sound mind. I hope that comes across. And um, I, have, I have no, no intention of retiring. Uh, until I have to, and uh, until I no longer make sense, in which case someone else is going to have to inform me. So <laughs> Wonderful. Well, we certainly thank you for joining us today, Dr. Roseman. It's been an absolute pleasure. And I know, I know that uh, a lot of our viewers will certainly get uh, a lot from this. So thank you once again. Well, thank you once again for inviting me on your podcast, Bradley. God's blessings to your work, and uh, I hope we have an opportunity to do this again. Absolutely. And for uh, those of you who are further interested, uh, again, his website is parentguru.com. Definitely uh, a, a very wise individual, uh, somebody that I can say in, in my personal life I've learned a lot from, uh, and it's been an absolute blessing uh, having him as an acquaintance. Uh, so I thank you all for watching um, and certainly hope this has blessed you. Again, you can find uh, our website, alternatemedia.com uh, and uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel. We have a weekly live stream that happens on Sundays at 4 p.m. So uh, thank you for watching and shalom.